They call me the exterminator. At one brief point of intersection, I did exercise that function and witnessed the belly dance of roaches suffocating in yellow Perithium powder. Hard to get now, lady. War on. Let you have a little two-dollar. Sluiced fat dead bugs from rolled wallpaper in shabby theatrical hotels on North Clark and poisoned the purposeful rat. Occasional eater of human babies, wouldn't you? Manhattan Serenade. AJ and Entourage start into a New York nightclub. A.J. is leading a purple-ass baboon on a gold chain. A.J. is dressed in checked linen plus fours with a cashmere jacket. Manager. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What's that? A.J. It's a delirium poodle. Choicest beast a man can latch on to. It'll raise the tone of your trap. Manager, I suspect it to be a purple-assed baboon, and it stands outside. Stooge, don't you know who this is? It's A.J., last of the big-time spenders. Manager, leave him take his purple-assed bastard and big-time spend someplace else. A.J. stops in front of another club and looks in. Elegant fags and old cunts, God damn it, we come to the right place. Avanti, Regali! He drives a gold stick into the floor and pickets the baboon. He begins talking in elegant tones, his stooges filling in. Fantastic! Monstrous! Utter heaven! A.J. puts a long cigarette holder in his mouth. A holder is made of some obscenely flexible material. It swings and undulates as if endowed with loathsome reptilian life. A.J. So there I was, flat on my stomach at 30,000 feet. Several nearby fags raise their heads like animals scenting danger. A.J. leaps to his feet with an inarticulate snarl. You purple-ass cocksucker, he screams. I'll teach you to shit on the floor. He pulls the whip from his umbrella and cuts the baboon across the ass. The baboon screams and tears loose the snake. He leaps on the next table and climbs up an old woman who dies of heart failure on the spot. Sorry, lady, discipline, you know. In a frenzy, he whips the baboon from one end of the bar to the other. The baboon, screaming and snarling and shitting with terror, climbs over the clients, runs up and down the bar, swings from drapes and chandeliers. A.J. You'll straighten up and shit right or you won't be in a condition to shit one way or the other. Stooge, you ought to be ashamed of yourself upsetting A.J. after all he's done for you. A.J., ingrates, every one of them ingrates. Take it from an old queen.
first you gotta hear. Boy in Los Angeles, 15 year old. Father decided it's time the boy had his first piece of ass. Boys lying on the lawn reading comic books. Father go out and say, son, here's $20. I want you to go to a good whore and get a piece of ass off her. So they drive to this plush jump joint. And the father say, all right, son, you're on your own. So ring the bell, and when the woman come, give her the $20 and tell her you want a piece of ass. Sell it, Bob. So about 15 minutes later, the boy comes out. Well, son, did you get a piece of ass? Yeah. This cash comes to the door, and I say I want a piece of ass. They made the double saucy on her. We go up to her trap, and she removed her dry goods. So I switch my blade and cut a big hunk off her ass. She raised up beef like I am reduced to pull off one shoe and beat her brains out. Then I hop her for kicks. To this end, I devised several forms of disciplinary procedure. One was known as the switchboard. Electric drills that can be turned on at any time are clamped against the subject's teeth, and he is instructed to operate an arbitrary switchboard to put certain connections in certain sockets in response to bells and lights. Every time he makes a mistake, the drills are turned on for 20 seconds. The signals are gradually speeded up beyond his reaction time. Half an hour on the switchboard and the subject breaks down like an overloaded thinking machine. The study of thinking machines teaches us more about the brain than we can learn by introspective methods. Many subjects are vulnerable to sexual humiliation. Negative stimulation with aphrodisiacs, a constant supervision to embarrass subject and prevent relief of masturbation. Erections during sleep automatically turn on an enormous vibrating electric buzzer that throws the subject out of bed into cold water thus reducing the incidence of wet dreams to a minimum. <laughs> Kicks to hypnotize a priest and tell him he's about to consummate a hypostatic union with the lamb. Then steer a randy old sheep up his ass. After that, the interrogator can gain complete hypnotic control. The subject will come at his whistle, shit on the floor if he but say open sesame. Needless to say, the sex humiliation angle is uh, contraindicated for overt homosexuals. I mean, let's keep our eye on the ball here and remember the old party line. Never know who's listening in. I recall this one kid I conditioned to shit inside of me. Then I wash his ass and screw him. It was real tasty and he was a lovely fella too. And sometimes a subject will burst into boy's tears because it can't keep him ejaculating when you screw him. Well, as you can plainly see, the possibilities are endless, like meandering paths in a great, big, beautiful garden. The subject will come at his whistle, shit on the floor if he but say open sesame. We must never forget our glorious Simeon heritage. Doc Brubeck was party in a second part. A retired abortionist and junk pusher, he was a veterinarian actually, recalled to service during the manpower shortage. Well, Doc had been in the hospital kitchen all morning, goosing the nurses and tanking up on coal gas and clim. And just before the operation, he sneaked a double shot of nutmeg to nerve himself up. 
I had a yahe hang over me and had no condition to take any of Browbeck shit. First thing he comes on with, I should start the incision from the back instead of the front, muttering some garbled nonsense about being sure to cut out the gallbladder and would fuck up the meat. Thought he was on the farm cleaning a chicken. I tell him to go put his head back in the oven. Whereupon he had the effrontery to push my hand, severing the patient's femoral artery. Blood spurted up and blinded the anesthetist who ran out through the hole screaming. Brubeck tried to knee me in the groin and I managed to hamstring him with my scalpel. He crawled about the floor, stabbing at my feet and legs. Violet, that's my baboon assistant, the only woman I ever cared a damn about, really winked. I climbed up on the table and poised myself to jump on Brubeck with both feet and stomp him when the cops rushed in. Well, this rumble in the operating room, this unspeakable occurrence, as the super put it, you might say was the blow off. The wolf back was closing for the kill. A crucifixion, that's the only word for it. Of course, I made a few dumbites here and there, who hasn't? There was the time me and the anesthetist drank up all ether and a patient came up on us. And I was accused of cutting the cocaine with Santa Claus. Violet did it actually, we had to protect her, of course. So the wind up is we are all drummed out of the industry. Not that Violet was a bona fide croaker, neither was Brubick. For that matter, even my own certificate was called in question. But Violet knew more medicine than the Mayo Clinic. She had an extraordinary intuition and a high sense of duty. So there I was, flat on my ass with no certificate. Should I turn to another trade? No, doctoring was in my blood. I managed to keep up my habit performing cut-rate abortions in subway toilets. I even descended to hustling pregnant women in the public streets. It was positively unethical. Then I met a great guy, Pacenta Juan, the afterbirth tycoon. Quackyoodle Cannibal Society initiates bite off noses and ears. A coprophage calls for a plate, shits on it, and eats the shit, exclaiming, Mmm, that's my rich substance. Gentle reader, the ugliness of this spectacle buggers description. Who can be a cringing, pissing coward, yet vicious as a purple-assed mandrel, alternating these deplorable conditions like vaudeville skits? Who can shit on a fallen adversary who, dying, eats the shit and screams with joy? Who can hang a weak passive and catch your sperm in mouth like a vicious dog? Gentle reader, I fade would spare you this, but my pen hath its will like the ancient mariner. Oh Christ, what a scene is this. Can tongue or pen accommodate these scandals? A beast the young hooligan has gouged out the eye of his contrary and fucks him in the brain. This brain answers the already and drives grandmother's cunt.
Life, the unlucky, was a tall, thin Norwegian with a patch over one eye. His face congealed in a permanent ingratiating smirk. Behind him lay an epic saga of unsuccessful enterprises. He had failed at raising frogs, chinchilla, Siamese fighting fish, Ramian culture pearls. He had attempted, variously and without success, to promote the lovebird to in a coffin cemetery, to quarter the condom market during the rubber shortage, to run a mail order whorehouse, to issue penicillin as a patent medicine. He had followed disastrous betting systems in the casinos of Europe and the racetracks of the US. His reverses in business were matched by the incredible mischances of his personal life. His front teeth had been stomped out by bestial American sailors in Brooklyn. Vultures had eaten out an eye when he drank a pint of paragoric and passed out in a Panama City park. He had been trapped between floors in an elevator for five days with an oil-burning junk habit and sustained an attack of deep tease while stowing away in a footlocker. Then there was the time he collapsed with strangulated intestines, perforated ulcers, and peritonitis in Cairo, and the hospital was so crowded they bedded him in the latrine, and the Greek surgeon goofed and sewed up a live monkey in him, and he was gang-fucked by the Arab attendants. And one of the orderlies stole the penicillin, substituting Saniflush. The time he got clap in his ass, and a self-righteous English doctor cured him with an enema of hot sulfuric acid. Strapping on a rubber penis. Steely Dan 3 from Yokohama, she says, caressing the shaft. Milk spurts across the room. Be sure that milk is pasteurized. Don't go giving me some kind of awful cow disease, like anthrax or glanders or aftosis. When I was a transvestite, lives and shy, used to work as an exterminator. Make advances to pretty boys for the thrill of being beaten as a man. Later, I catch this one kid, overpower him with supersonic judo, I learned from an old lesbian Zen monk. I tie him up, strip off his clothes with a razor, and fuck him with Steely Dan 1. He is so relieved I don't castrate him literal. He comes all over my bed bug spray. What happened to Steely Dan one? He was torn in two by a bull dyke. Most terrific vaginal grip I ever experienced. She could cave in a lead pipe. It was one of her parlor tricks. Steely Dan two. Chewed the bits by a famished kangaroo in the upper baboon's asshole. And don't say we this time. Why not? It's real boyish. The rising sun fills the room with pink light. Johnny is let in, hands tied between Mary and Mark. Johnny sees the gallows and sighs with a great oh, his chin pulling down towards his cock, his legs bending at the knees. Sperm spurts arching almost vertical in front of his face. Mark and Mary are suddenly impatient and hot. 
They pushed Johnny forward onto the gallows platform, covered with moldy jock straps and sweatshirts. Mark is adjusting the noose. Well, here you go. Mark starts to push Johnny off the platform. Mary, no, let me. She locks her hands behind Johnny's buttocks, puts her forehead against him. Smiling into his eyes, she moves back, pulling him off the platform into space. His face swells with blood. Mark reaches up with one lithe movement and snaps Johnny's neck. A shudder runs down Johnny's body. One foot flutters like a trapped bird. Mark has draped himself over a swing and mimics Johnny's twitches. Closes his eyes and sticks his tongue out. Johnny's cock springs up and Mary guides his upper cunt. Writhing against him in a fluid belly dance and rolling and shrieking with delight. Sweat pours down her body. Hair hangs over her face in wet strands. Cut him down, Mark, she screams. Mark reaches over with a snap knife and cuts the rope, catching Johnny as he falls, easing him onto his back with Mary still impaled and writhing. She bites away Johnny's lips and nose and sucks out his eyes with a pop. She tears off great hunks of cheek. Now she lunches on his prick. Mark walks over to her and she looks up from Johnny's half-eaten genitals. Her face covered with blood, eyes phosphorescent. Mark puts his foot on her shoulder and kicks her over on her back. He leaps on her, fucking her insanely. They roll from one end of the room to the other, pinwheel end over end, and leap high in the air like a great hooked fish. Let me hang you, Mark. Let me hang you, please, Mark. Let me hang you. Sure, baby. He pulls her brutally to her feet and pins her hands behind her. No, Mark, no, 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 she screams. Shitting and pissing in terror as he drags her to the platform. outfit known as Islam Inc. Financed by AJ, the notorious merchant of sex, who scandalized international society when he appeared at the Duke de Ventre's ball as a walking penis covered by a huge condom emblazoned with the AJ motto, they shall not pass. AJ once reserved a table a year in advance, Chez Robert where a huge icy gourmet broods over the greatest cuisine in the world. So baneful and derogatory is his gaze that many a client under that withering blast has rolled on the floor and pissed all over himself in convulsive attempts to ingratiate. So A.J. arrives with six Bolivian Indians who chew coca leaves between courses. And when Robert, in all his gourmet majesty, bears down on the table, A.J. looks up and yells, Hey, boy, bring me some ketchup. Thirty gourmets stop chewing at once. You could have heard a souffle drop. As for Robert, he lets out a bellow of rage like a wounded elephant, runs to the kitchen and arms himself with a meat cleaver. The sommelier snarls hideously, his face turning a strange iridescent purple. He breaks off a bottle of Brut Champagne 26. 
Pierre, the head waiter, snatches up a boning knife. All three chase AJ through the restaurant with mangled, inhuman screams of rage. Tables overturn, vintage wines and matchless food crash to the floor. Cries of lynch him ring through the air. An elderly gourmet with the insane bloodshot eyes of a mandrel is fashioning a hangman's knot with a red velvet curtain cord. Seeing himself cornered in an imminent danger of dismemberment at least, A.J. plays his trump card. He throws back his head and lets out a hog call. And a hundred famished hogs he had stationed nearby rushed into the restaurant, slopping the half cuisine. Like a great tree, Robert falls to the floor in a stroke where he is eaten by the hogs. Poor bastards don't know enough to appreciate him, says A.J. Robert's brother Paul emerges from his tavern in a local nut house and takes over the restaurant to dispense something he calls the transcendental cuisine. Imperceptibly, the quality of the food declines until he is serving literal garbage. The clients, being too intimidated by the reputation of Chez Robert to protest. Sample menu. The clear camel piss soup with boiled earthworms. The filet of sun-ripened stingray, basted with eau de cologne and garnished with nettles. The afterbirth supreme de boeuf, cooked and drained crankcase oil, served with a piquant sauce of rotten egg yolks and crushed bedbugs. Limburger cheese sugar cured in diabetic urine, doused in canned heat, Flamboyant. So the clients are quietly dying of botulism. Then A.J. returns with an entourage of Arab refugees from the Middle East. He takes one mouth, one scream. Garbage, goddammit! Cook this wise citizen in his own swill. Cornered the KY market in North Africa. And finally hit the jackpot with slumps. He prospered and proliferated, flooding the world with cut medicines and cheap counterfeit goods of every variety. Adulterated shark repellent, cut antibiotics, condemned the parachutes, stale anti-venom. Inactive serums and vaccines, leaking lifeboats. You ever dig the Mayan codices? I figure it like this. The priests, about 1% of the population, made with one-way telepathic broadcasts, instructing the workers what to feel and when. A telepathic sender has to send all the time. He can never receive, because if he receives, that means someone else has feelings of his own, could douse up his continuity. The sender has to send all the time, but he can't ever recharge himself by contact. Sooner or later, he's got no feelings to send. You can't have feelings alone. Not alone like the sender is alone. And you dig there can only be one sender at one place time. Finally, the screen goes dead. The sender has turned into a huge centipede. So the workers come in on the beam and burn the centipede and elect a new sender by consensus of the general will. The Mayans were limited by isolation. Now one sender could control the planet. You see, control can never be a means to any practical.
practical end. It can never be a means to anything but more control. Like junk. A man with white tie and dress shirt Naked from the waist down, except for black garters, talks to the queen bee in elegant tones. Queen bees are old women who surround themselves with fairies to form a swarm. It is a sinister Mexican practice. But where is the statuary? He talks out of one side of his face. The other is twisted by the torture of a million mirrors. He masturbates wildly. The queen bee continues the conversation, notices nothing. A horde of lust-mad American women rush in, dripping cunts from farm and dude ranch, factory, brothel, country club, penthouse and suburb, motel and yacht, and cocktail bar. Strip off riding clothes, ski togs, evening dresses, Levi's, tea gowns, print dresses, slacks, bathing suits, and kimonos. They scream and yipe and howl, leap on the guests like bitch dogs in heat with rabies. They claw at the hangboys, shrieking, you fairy, you bastard, fuck me, fuck me, fuck me! The guests flee screaming, dodge among the hang the boys, overturn iron lungs. Another installment in the adventures of Clem Snide, the private asshole. So I walk in the joint in this female hustler suit to park. And I think, oh God, you're pulled to look so already. I mean, it's like I see the gas before. So I don't pay her no mind at first. Then I dig she is rubbing her legs together and working her feet up behind her head. Shoves it down to give herself a deuce job with a gadget sticks out of her nose. The way a body can't help but notice. Iris, half Chinese and half Negro, addicted dehydroxyheroin, takes a shot every 15 minutes, to which end she leaves droppers and needles sticking out all over her. The needles rust in her dry flesh, which here and there is grown completely over a joint to form a smooth green-brown wind. On the table in front of her is a samovar of tea and a 20-pound hamper of brown sugar. No one has ever seen her eat anything else. It's only just before a shot that she hears what anyone says or talks herself. Then she makes some flat factual statement relative to her own person. My asshole is a clean. My cunt got terrible green juices. Iris is one of Ben May's projects. The human body can run on sugar alone, goddammit. I'm aware that certain of my learned colleagues who attempted to belittle my genius work claim that I put vitamins and proteins into Iris's sugar clandestinely. I challenge these nameless assholes to crawl up out of their latrines and run a spot analysis on Iris' sugar and her teeth. Iris is a wholesome American cunt. I deny categorically that she nourishes herself on semen. And let me take this opportunity to state that I am a reputable scientist, not a charlatan, a lunatic, or a pretended worker of miracles. I never claimed that Iris could subsist exclusively on photosynthesis. I did not say she could breathe in carbon dioxide and give off oxygen. I confess I have been tempted to experiment, being of course restrained by my medical ethics. 
In short, the vile slanders of my creeping opponents will inevitably fall back onto them and come to roost like a homing stool pigeon. Gentle reader, we see God through our assholes in the flashbulb of orgasm. Through these orifices, transmute your body. The way out is the way in. Now I, William Seward, will unlock my word for it. My Viking heart fares over the great brown river. Where motors putt, putt, putt in jungle twilight And whole trees float with huge snakes in the branches And sad-eyed memers watch the shore Across the Missouri field, the boy finds a pink arrowhead Out along distant train whistles Comes back to me Hungry as a street boy, don't know to pedal the ass God gave him. Gentle reader, the word will leap on you with leopard man iron claws. It will cut off fingers and toes like an opportunist land crab. It will hang you and catch your jism like a scrutable dog. It will coil around your thighs like a bushmaster and inject a shot glass of rancid ectoplasm. I am not American Express. Quick! White flash, mangled insect screams. I woke up with a taste of metal in my mouth, back from the dead, trailing the colorless death smell, afterbirth of a withered gray monkey, phantom twinges of amputation. Taxi boys waiting for a pickup, Eduardo said, and died of an overdose in Madrid. Powder trains burn back through pink convolutions of tumescent flesh, set off flash bulbs of orgasm, pinpoint photos of arrested motion, smooth brown side twisted to light a cigarette. He stood there in a 1920 straw hat somebody gave him, soft mendicant words falling like dead birds in the dark street. No, no more, no moss. The heaving sea of air hammers in the purple-brown dusk, tainted with rotten metal smell of sewer gas. Young worker faces vibrating out of focus in yellow halos of carbide lanterns. Broken pipes exposed. They are rebuilding the city. Lee nodded absently. Yes, always. Either way is a bad move to the east wing. If I knew, I'd be glad to tell you. No good, no bueno. Hustling myself. No glut, plump lighting. 